Well, hello, CBC. It's good to be back with you tonight um, for our daily uh, Facebook Live at 516. And tonight's also going to be our Cafe Kism. And so I invite you right afterwards, if you'd like to continue the discussion, you can join us on Zoom. I think we got it figured out. And so uh, I posted on the Facebook page under the Cafe Kism announcement, I posted a link, which hopefully will get you into Zoom. And that meeting room will be open right after uh, we finish the Facebook Live. So hopefully you can join us for that. Uh, it'd be good to have you uh, just to continue discussion as we uh, continue this preparation for Easter week. And so I'm glad that you are with us. Hopefully you were able to watch the service this morning and be encouraged, uh, even though it's an online service. Um, it's, it's been neat to see how our body has stayed together and stayed unified. And that is just encouraging for me. And um, hopefully we can continue to do that. This is going to be a, a unique week again with Easter week coming up um, and doing it more online. But hopefully we can keep everyone together and Facebook and technology is, is sort of helping us out. And so that's neat how uh, we're able to use that for the Lord's glory. But I do want to welcome you tonight. Facebook Live, what I'm going to do is I just want to cover a little bit with uh, Isaiah 52 and 53 again this evening and then invite you, like I said, to join us um, afterwards for uh, Zoom, a Zoom uh, video conference where you can ask any questions that you want. But I do want to welcome you and um, just want to make a, a few comments, uh, or actually I wanted to read some lyrics to a song. I wish I had musical skill. I mean, like I said, I feel so inadequate when it comes to these Facebook Lives because I don't play the dulcimer, I don't play the guitar, I don't play the piano. Can't sing worth a lick, and so I'm sort of at a disadvantage. Um, I could sing another children's song, but uh, that would probably not be helpful. But I do want to read the words to the song that if you joined the live um, broadcast this morning and you were watching a little countdown, behind that countdown was an incredible song called Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery. And we have sung that song a few times at our church. I just want to read the words again to that song and just think about uh, these words to Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery. It's written by Matt Boswell. It says, Come behold the wondrous mystery in the dawning of the King, he the theme of heaven's praises, robed in frail humanity. In our longing, in our darkness, now the light of life has come. Look to Christ who condescended, took on flesh to ransom us. Come behold the wondrous mystery, he the perfect son of man. In his living, in his suffering, never trace nor stain of sin. See the true and better Adam come to save the hell-bound man. Christ the great and sure fulfillment of the law in him we stand. Come behold the wondrous mystery, Christ the Lord upon the tree. In the steed of ruined sinners hangs the lamb in victory. See the price of our redemption, see the Father's plan unfold bringing many sons to glory, grace unmeasured, love untold. Come behold the wondrous mystery, slain by death, the God of life. But no grave could e'er restrain him, praise the Lord, he is alive. What a foretaste of deliverance, how unwavering our hope, Christ in power resurrected, as we will be when he comes. And that's just a, an encouraging song, an awesome song. And I do encourage you to, to look up those words and just uh, ponder them. I think sometimes we've gotten so used to the, um, the story of Christ, the redemptive story, that we forget what a wondrous mystery it is. And I hope uh, Isaiah, going over that this morning, helped you again to remember the mystery of who Christ is and what he has come to do. And I, it's just amazing when you look at Isaiah's prophecy, again, written um, 700 years before Christ's birth. And yet, when you read these words, there's only one person that could have fulfilled it, and it's Jesus Christ himself. And again, just want to just go over a little bit with Isaiah 52, 53. If you want to join us afterwards to ask any questions, you're welcome to. But again, the second half of Isaiah is dealing with comfort and grace. And the first half, one, chapters 1 through 39, is a little bit more on God's judgment, the people's sin, their transgression, his judgment on the nations. Then in chapter 40, you have this comfort ye, uh, towards God's people. And even towards the nations as you start to understand God's redemptive story. And there's four servant songs in the second half. In um, Isaiah 42, uh, he begins the first servant song. says, Behold my servant whom I behold, 
Uh, my elect one in whom my soul delights, I put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He'll not cry out, nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoking flax he will not quench. And so God introduces his servant in chapter 42 and says he's going to have a compassionate kind of ministry. Um, even the weakest person he is going to care for and show compassion on. Then you go to Isaiah 49, and you have the second servant song, and, and there you have um, these words. Indeed, God says, is it too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel? I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. And so now we see that the servant's going to have a ministry to not only Israel, but he's going to be a light to the nations and to the Gentiles. Then you go over to chapter 50, and now there's an element of suffering that was alluded to earlier, but now is added to it. And we probably have heard these verses, Isaiah 50. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away. Then these words in verse 6, I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. And so this mystery of this servant is now being um, added to, and Isaiah is sort of building this climax that we see in this fourth servant song. And so this is a key because he's introduced the servant, and he's explained um, that this servant's going to redeem Israel and be a light to the Gentiles. He's going to be the one that brings salvation. But there's going to be some aspect of suffering and rejection that's going to accompany his ministry. And then you get to the fourth song. And that's what we looked at this morning. And again, I just see the incredible dichotomy in chapter 52, verse 13, where God introduces his servant. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. And again, those are the same words used in Isaiah 6 to describe God. And now they're used to describe God's servant. And God says he has as much glory as I do. That's pretty intriguing. But then verse 14, just as many were astonished at you, and his visage was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. And so again, I, I hope you see this. What, what um, God introduces and what Isaiah introduces is this servant that has great exultation, but at the same time great suffering. To be exalted high and to be lifted up like God is, but at the same time to be so uh, marred and... Um, um, bruised and suffered that you can't even tell he's a man. How do you reconcile those two? And right in the middle of this dichotomy, he says, so he shall sprinkle many nations. And again, that's a priestly function. He's going to sprinkle many nations. And obviously, that goes back to a priestly function of sprinkling blood on the nations. But I think the question would be, well, what blood is he going to sprinkle on the nations? Uh, what kind of priest is he? Uh, it's going to be shocking to find out that he's going to Sprinkle his own blood is what's going to be what purifies the nations. And so, like I said, kings can't figure this out. They shut their mouths. And then you get to chapter 53, and we know those early words, uh, who has believed our report, which I think the implication is who would believe this? Who would believe this story, this wondrous mystery? And then he says, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And I hope you caught that this morning, that, again, when you talk about the arm of the Lord, you're talking about how God shows his power. How does he flex his muscles, so to speak? And certainly, um, most people think if God's going to flex his muscles, he's going to do it in some spectacular kind of display. And again, I want to give you a little context. Uh, if you go back to Isaiah 51, verse 9, uh, the people are, are sort of shouting, Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in the ancient days, in the generations of old. Are you not the arm that cut Rahab apart and wounded the serpent? And in chapter 52, verse 10, the Lord has made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. So when you understand the context, what Isaiah is saying is the people are we're longing for God to show his power. We're longing for him to uh, rescue us, to show salvation. And again, our expectation is for God to bear his arm and to flex his muscles through this great display of power. And yet, Isaiah 53 introduces a lamb. Um, do you understand the wondrous mystery how God saves us through a lamb? Um, again, think through the illustration I used this morning. If you're being attacked by wolves, you're being attacked by wild animals, and uh, you almost picture the, the Lassie kind of show, and here comes the animal over the hillside to rescue you, and 
and over the hillside comes this little innocent lamb, you're thinking, well, this ain't going to help at all. But if that lamb becomes the one that the wolves turn away from you and attack the lamb, then the lamb in some sense becomes the substitute and saves you. And I know that's not the perfect illustration, but again, uh, a lamb is not what we expect. I've always said that no football team names themselves the lambs. Uh, we, we like the tigers and the lions and the bears, all these powerful animals, uh, and yet God saves us through a lamb. Uh, it's the lamb who's the one that God shows his power through. And think about that. I think when people think through redemption, they're probably going back to the Exodus story and they're thinking uh, God's going to do something spectacular. He's going to, uh, all the plagues, and you think of uh, Charlton Heston, you know, uh, splitting the Red Sea, and that's how we sort of picture God's power being displayed. But you know where the real power was during Passover? It, it wasn't when Moses split the Red Sea. Yeah, that was spectacular. But the real power happened on Passover night. That's why it's called Passover. And what saved the people? It was the blood of an innocent lamb, a precious lamb. Like Ken said this morning, the lamb was selected on the 10th day of Nisan and was slaughtered on the 14th day, which means for four days this lamb was in your home. Could you imagine if you had kids and you have a lamb that's in your home for four days and how attached they grow to this lamb and then that lamb is the lamb that is killed? And its blood is the one that's uh, put on the doorposts. It's the precious lamb. And we are saved by a lamb. God displays his power through a lamb. It's not what we expect. And I, as I thought about that, you just go through Isaiah, and do you just behold the wondrous mystery that God brings deliverance through a substitute, through a lamb? Um, all through this chapter, we find out if you miss the substitutionary death of Christ, then uh, you miss the whole point of the book of Isaiah, really the whole point of the whole Old Testament sacrificial system where they would put their hands on the sacrificial animal as a way of identification, then that animal would be killed in their place. That was all a giant arrow pointing towards this servant who's going to come and rescue them, a servant who's going to be a lamb. And so again, if you... I, I, Neglected uh, this morning during the message, I uh, forgot to mention some of the um, impacts of this, not only with his death, but his resurrection. If you read Isaiah 53, do you see his resurrection? Well, of course you do. He's exalted, so you know that he is one who is going to live. Death did not end his life. But look at verse 10. It says, uh, The Lord has put him to grief, and when you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, and he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Here's a servant who is killed. He's cut off from the land of the living. Uh, he has his grave with, uh, well, it should be with the wicked, or he's killed with the wicked, but then he has his tomb with a rich man's tomb. So you know he's dead, and yet God says he's going to prolong his days. This is an Old Testament prophecy of the uh, death and resurrection of this coming servant. And then I love how God uh, comes back into the picture. He introduces his servant in chapter 52, 13, at the end of 53, uh, he comes back into the picture and he says, By his knowledge my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Do you hear that? My righteous servant, the one who is spotless, the one who is righteous, the one who has done everything in line with God's righteousness, he has fulfilled the law, perfect obedience. He has done what we could not do. We transgressed the law, which uh, I love those three words, sin, iniquity, and transgression. Sin means we fall short. Uh, we try to meet God's standard, we can't. Iniquity sort of has the idea of we twist God's standard. We justify our actions and we uh, justify our sin. Uh, transgressions means there's oftentimes I know what's the right thing to do and I just don't want to do it. I, I sort of uh, stiffen my neck and I go my own way. And here's the righteous servant, the one who shows perfect submission, who fulfills God's righteousness perfectly, never twist God's truth, um, and then is the righteous servant who dies in our place. Perfect obedience, becoming our substitute. Perfect obedience, deserving life. Our disobedience, deserving death. And him taking our death and giving us his life. And by his knowledge, and I think a better translation would be by knowledge of him. By knowing him, by trusting him, my righteous servant shall justify, shall make righteous many, for he shall bear their iniquities. There could not be a clearer prophecy of what Christ came to do, the Lamb of God. He came to bear our sins. I do uh, some other little aspects of this passage I didn't mention this morning is 
what's called the prophetic perfect. And I had a little excerpt there on your um, sermon notes where all of this is written in the past tense, which is interesting. This is written 700 years before Christ is born, but it's all in the past tense. And this is called the prophetic perfect. It's used in other passages where the prophet actually speaks in the past tense about a future event, saying, this is so sure in the mind of God, nothing is going to detour God. The zeal of the Lord of hosts is going to accomplish this. And if we know from Scripture, he's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. This was God's eternal plan for the Son to die in our place. Um, and so you see this wondrous mystery of who Christ is and the contrast and the resurrection. But it doesn't end there. You hear his exaltation. And I want to go back to 52.13. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall deal wisely. He shall do everything perfectly. He shall be exalted and extolled, or he shall be exalted and lifted up and be very high. And I like what John MacArthur says. Uh, he shall be exalted. He shall be lifted very high. Uh, he shall be lifted up and he shall be very high. Almost like three stages. He shall be exalted. I think that's his resurrection. Um, he shall be lifted up. I think that's his ascension. And he shall be very high. I think that's his coronation. I think that's when he comes back and reigns on this earth. And so he is the righteous servant who fulfills everything perfectly. And so... Uh, just understand, believer, that you are saved by a lamb. And that is exactly the opposite of what our world exalts and looks for. Again, think of all the superhero movies. Uh, superheroes are always the powerful and the, and the ones that come and rescue us. And that's what the world looks for. That's what people were looking for on Palm Sunday, this uh, deliverer that would come in and, and show this incredible power. And God showed his power. He bared his arm by sending a lamb. Like I said, you've never heard of a superhero called Lamb Man because uh, we exalt power and God shows the path of humility, which if you think about it, is a greater power because to show humility in the face of injustice, to show humility in the face of uh, those that shake your, their fist in your face is an incredible power. Why are we so fascinated with Christ and what he did on the cross? Because we recognize that's not how we act. If there's injustice, if we feel like we're being wronged, what is your first instinct? Uh, even when you get in a line, uh, I always talk about when I go to Sam's or someplace and I try to pick the right line because in my mind uh, it should move at the same pace. And I, I always hate it when the line next to me that I, I thought I picked the right line, the line next to me gets through the line before me and I feel almost like I've been wronged. That's... that's <laughs> How insignificant, but that shows us how in our mind we are so prone to react to injustice or whatever we perceive as injustice. And here's one who was suffered the ultimate injustice. He deserved life. He deserved exaltation, and yet he was despised and rejected of men, and he was actually killed as a criminal, and yet he opened not his mouth. And that's how God showed his humility. That's how God shows his strength. What's really awesome, I just want to go to Revelation um, I'm going a little long here, but Revelation chapter 4 and 5, and again, uh, we are, we're also fascinated by Revelation and all the apocalyptic language, but to, you know, under, to really understand Revelation, you have to understand chapters 4 and 5, and this is where John is transported into heaven, and he sees God on his throne, and all this incredible display of glory in heaven, and there's this uh, scroll and I think the scroll is the title deed to earth. I think the scroll is that which enables our redemption. That's that which restores what was lost in Genesis. We all know that something's wrong with this world. I mean, we have a sense of desiring this world to be at peace, for us to be at peace. But we know that this world is in travail. There's birth pains. There's the bondage of decay. There's sorrows. There's death. And we always try to make life work, and it just doesn't. And we are encountering disappointment and suffering and pain. And uh, what's wrong with this world and who can fix it? And I think that's what this title deed represents. Who can restore what was lost in Genesis 3? Who can do this? And it says that John weeps because there's no one worthy. No one, no man can do this. No politician can do this. No uh, United Nations mandate can do this. And so he weeps. I think his weeping is what the weeping of all of humanity. And then uh, an angel says, says this, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And again, you're waiting for a lion, because that's what we expect, right? The lion of Judah to come, the king of kings to come and, and to show his power. And then verse 6, I looked, and behold, 
in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. The wondrous mystery. We're waiting for a line. We're waiting for God to show this incredible power. And he shows his power in the redemption of a lamb. And that lamb is the one who bore your sin and bore my sin. And that lamb is the one who should change our hearts. Because um, the humility that God has shown, and, and you can't fathom it. Uh, there's no way we can fathom it. Because we'd be in awe all the time if we fathomed how the God who holds the universe in the span of his hands, who sustains us right now with his breath, one who just is so incomprehensible, uh, entered our world and took on human flesh, became the Lamb of God. Remember what John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. God showed incredible humility to save us. And so, believer, you are loved. If you're not a believer, you're loved with a love that you cannot comprehend by a God who is willing to humble himself to save you, a God that you can't comprehend, a love that is, um, that's why Paul prays, just try to understand the height and the width and the breadth and the depth of the love of God. It'll change you if you really focus on what it is. But God's humility, I think, as I was trying to think, what's the application of this? Here's the application. You can trust the heart of God. No matter what you're going through, no matter what is going on in this world, no matter if you feel like life is out of control, you're out of control, the world's out of control, You can trust the heart of God, a God who humbles himself to save you, a God that shows that kind of amazing grace and incomprehensible love. You can trust him. And I think that needs to be something that we just lean upon, is the goodness of God, the grace of God, the love of God, that his mercies are new every morning. And no matter what we go through, believer, uh, God loves us, and you can trust his heart. I do think it's interesting that it's in Isaiah right after this prophecy that we have these words that sometimes we hear them so often, but we don't really know the context. Isaiah 55, of course, Isaiah 55 is also an invitation to salvation, but it says this, My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. In other words, uh, God doesn't do what we expect. Did any of y'all expect that we'd be doing online services for Palm Sunday and Easter this year? I certainly didn't. But can we trust the heart of God? Can we trust that God is doing something that we may not realize? Now, people are complaining, or I don't say complaining, but I've heard people talk about how hard it is because churches are closed and some are sort of meeting in sort of defiance of all these things. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to put all that in God's hands. But churches are not closed. God is still at work. He is still on his throne. And his ways are not our ways. This is not what we would expect, but if he's causing the message to go out in ways that we could not have anticipated, uh, using technology for his glory, then praise God. I'm going to trust him because God works all things according to the counsel of his will. And believer, you can trust him too, no matter what you're going through. So this week coming up, uh, every night we're going to be on live 516. This is Easter week, and we're leading up to Resurrection Sunday, and we're going to rejoice even if we have to do it online. That's okay. And I hope you can join us each night. Uh, Monday night, our associate pastor, uh, Zach Benton, is going to speak. And then Tuesday night, uh, Brandon Baird. Wednesday night, um, uh, Stephen Punke. Uh, Thursday night, we're going to do communion together, Passover kind of meal together. So we're going to encourage you to get some supplies for that. Friday night, Kim's going to lead us again in in a time of Good Friday worship. Uh, Saturday night, my wife's actually going to teach you all how to make Easter cookies that uh, you leave overnight and you can open up on Resurrection Sunday. And then on Easter Sunday uh, night, we're going to again celebrate the resurrection. And when we do uh, meet back together as corporate body, we're going to celebrate like it's Easter because really every Sunday is Easter Sunday. We should always remember that. The reason we meet on Sunday is because of the resurrection of Christ. So uh, maybe this is a good reminder for us that, yeah, I know Easter is special, but every Sunday is a time to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. Well, I'm going to switch over to Zoom, I hope. And if you want to continue the discussion, if you want to ask any questions about the Bible study, Uh, the sermon this morning or the Bible study, what you believe. Um, We're going to do that and just invite you to join us on Zoom. If you look on the invitation, I'm going to put it under this video as well. There should be a link. Hopefully that link will take you to Zoom. I know we had troubles last week. But join us for Cafe Kism. Uh, We're going to sit there and drink some coffee and talk theology and talk, answer questions that you may have and just enjoy some fellowship. So 
uh, thank you CBC and hopefully you will join us on Zoom right after this and again click on that link it should be underneath this uh, this advertisement for Catholicism and I'm also going to post it under this video as soon as I turn it off so I hope to see you there